Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we're going to be going on a tour of the deep web, and learning about the horrific consequences that you will face if you decide to go in too deep. Be warned, these stories are not for the faint of heart, and are graphic and disturbing. You have been warned. In order to proceed safely through the deep web, I have invited Elder's Vault to help guide and narrate some of the stories today, so you're in for a real treat. What's more is once we're done here, he and I are going on a deep web exploration. So be sure to follow us over to his channel when this video is over, and check out what the deep web is really like. But for now though, it's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I am a 17 year old high school male. Although I'm not a total outcast, I'm not exactly the most popular guy in school either. Overall, I would say I do a pretty good job of being friendly and accepting to all the social cliques. The nerds, the emos, the athletes, even one of the cheerleaders. You name it, I'm a pretty versatile person, socially speaking. That being said, I am somewhat of a loner, with very few close friends, and usually prefer to keep to myself. My reserved personality has caused me to spend a lot of time on the internet. It was about six months ago when I heard one of my few close associates mentioning something called the dark web. Or was it the deep web? Eh, I'm not really too concerned with the official name. Whatever it is, it's clearly an aspect of the World Wide Web that is far different from what you would typically find on the regular internet. At least, that's what I gathered from all the horror stories I kept hearing. He would describe things like crush porn, live executions, and all sorts of despicable acts that would make your stomach turn. For a while, I dismissed his stories as little more than attention grabbing. At best, I believed him to be grossly exaggerating what he was seeing. But eventually, my curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to check it out for myself. Looking back, I certainly wish I hadn't. I asked my friend how I could access this part of the web. Long story short, he hooked me up with a Tor browser, and helped walk me through the whole arduous process of entering this strange uncharted territory. Once I was in, I was navigating through the deep web like a piece of cake. As it turned out, much of what he was described to me turned out to be true as I discovered countless links to all kinds of violent videos, disgusting pornography, and hitman websites. None of it really caught my initial attention, and a few days later on a Sunday evening, I decided to log back into this place, purely out of boredom. As I began surfing through the deep web a second time, I came across a video called Cabin Torture, Something I had missed the first time round. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I clicked on the link. As it turned out, it was a live event rather than a pre-recording. The video began with an unseen cameraman wandering seamlessly without aim through a dense forest at night. The only illumination coming from a large flashlight he was holding. For several minutes, I heard the consistent sound of owls hooting, coyotes howling, and the crunching sounds of sticks on the ground as the cameraman trampled over them. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, he arrived at his destination, a nice quaint little cabin. He walked around the back of the cabin, and shone the light on through a window. I could make out a large bed with a man and woman sleeping peacefully side by side, before the cameraman walked around and advanced towards the door. Seemingly with no effort, the man was able to pick the door lock, 
and quietly enter the cabin. The flashlight continued to serve as the only illumination, as he made his way through the living room, down a dark hallway, and into the couple's bedroom, which of course, the door was wide open. The man entered the room, and shone the flashlight directly on the husband's face, apparently wanting to awaken him, and he got his wish. Who the hell are you? But the husband was cut off, as the intruder smacked him very hard with some kind of blunt instrument, which knocked him out cold. This caused the wife to wake up and begin screaming loud enough to wake the dead. She was also a receiver of a blowout knock to the head. I hoped for their sakes, the head blow would have been enough to kill them, and spare them from the agony of a far more painful death. But it wasn't to be. The intruder turned on the lamps in their rooms, and began the process of tying both of them up. The husband to a chair in the corner, and the wife to the bedpost, each by her arms and legs. What I saw next was nothing short of traumatizing. The husband and wife both regained consciousness, at about the same time, meaning that whoever the intruder targeted first would be in a position where they would be forced to watch the brutal torturing of their most beloved. He targeted the wife first, pulling down her pyjama bottoms. I then saw him pull out a huge butcher knife from his backpack, and proceeded to insert it into her vagina. I cringed in absolute disgust, as he rhythmically began to thrust the knife in and out of her while she screamed at the top of her lungs, and the bedsheets became drenched in her blood. Her sobbing was utterly heartbreaking, and that wasn't even the most despicable part of it. No. The worst was when he panned the camera down to show that he was touching himself. What kind of sick bastard do you have to be to derive pleasure from this sort of thing? When he climaxed, he forced his junk into the woman's mouth, and forced her to swallow. But he didn't kill her yet. He then turned his sights to the husband, who was still struggling with the rope binding him. The intruder slightly pulled down the husband's pyjamas to expose his endowment, and in no time, he used the knife to slice everything off leading to a muffled scream underneath the gag around his mouth, and for pleas and mercy from his still living wife. That wasn't enough to satisfy this monster's bloodlust though. He plunged the knife deep into the man's belly, and sliced it in real good, spilling out the man's entrails onto the floor, and finally, stabbing the man straight through the heart, leaving him to die. The wife begged the intruder to let her go, but he was having none of it. He pulled out a .22 caliber pistol from his pocket, pointed it straight at her head, and blew her brains out. At that point, the video feed cut off, and a message read, Thanks for watching, flashed across my screen. I sat there, utterly stunned and motionless, not knowing how to process what I had just seen. Just then, an internet chat box appeared, from the corner of my screen. A messenger, presumably the site owner asked, So, what do you think? I didn't even bother. I shut off my laptop, took it out the back, and smashed it to pieces with my father's sledgehammer. Afterwards, I retreated back to my bedroom and cried like a baby. Never in my whole life did I think I would observe something so vile, so disgusting, and so unimaginably horrific. I don't know if those psychos will track me down. I don't know if I could ever open up to my parents or friends about what I saw. All I know is that I will never access the deep web again. So, I was doing what I do best the other day, and by that, I mean sifting through that depraved cesspool of the internet known as the deep web, and just generally being a lazy sack of shit. I spend a lot of time doing that, just randomly clicking links to things I probably shouldn't, and then being horrified by what lies on the other side. I've seen a lot of shit on there, gore boards, dox bins, torture sites, 
IRL rape, animal cruelty, <laughs> you get the picture. You've all heard the stories. Everything wrong with the human species can be found somewhere on the deep web. Or so they say. I find it all fascinating. To glimpse people when anonymity takes hold and see what monstrous things people are capable of behind closed doors. It's like peeling back the curtain on a Sesame Street play and finding the showrunners having a satanic orgy backstage. You see people for what they really are. Monsters. So I began my voyage. Monster in hand and freshly stoned mind ready to be mortified. From my closet, the inflatable erotic doll I had been given as a gag Christmas present looked in a disapproving manner with a lifeless, open mouthed stare. Don't judge me, Miley. I performed the usual diagnostics and booted up tour. I found myself on the hidden wiki soon after, staring at the dozens of links available for the taking. I saw little of interest, so I quickly switched over to DuckDuckGo. I pondered upon what type to search in for a bit. You have to be careful how you go about browsing Tor, and randomly entering murder or torture into a search bar could get you into a world of trouble. You never know who's lurking. I finally ended up typing in one word. Sick. That ought to get some interesting results. The results were initially less than, I, than stellar, but soon I did find myself on an apparent blog of some sort. Darkness of the soul. Edginess level, maximum. I glanced through the blog and found dozens of entries ranging from paranormal, conspiracy theories, short stories, and real-life crime essays. It was actually pretty interesting, and the guy who wrote it indeed pretty gifted in the vernacular department. I spent some time glancing through them until one entry caught my eye. It was titled, Dark Sights on the Dark Web. Are they real? I found my interest peaked, so I clicked it. The article listed several relatively prominent and notoriously vile sites like Cannibal Cafe, Cruel Onion Wiki, Violent Fantasies, and Playpen, none of which were what I was really looking for. But then, one caught my eye that I didn't recognize. It was listed only as the site with no name. The author was even kind enough to provide a link, to which I clicked without a moment's hesitation. This hidden site has been seized as a part of a joint law enforcement operation by blah blah blah. I groaned while reclining in my swivel chair and downing the remainder of my monster. They've always have to take away the fun. Just as I was about to click back though, I noticed a small detail which drew my attention back. In the lower left hand quadrant of the page, there was a slight discoloration that caught my eye. I've seen that same message hundreds of times, but this one looked different. On a whim, I highlighted the section with my mouse. Just as I had suspected, a series of text lit up with strands of numbers. The numbers just looked like gibberish at first, but on a closer inspection, I noticed a single Russian word. Voity. Translation. Enter. Luckily for me, I speak a bit of Russian, so I recognized the phrase right away. I hovered the cursor over the word and watched as the pointer shifted to indicate a hidden link. Clever, hiding behind a smoke screen like that. That's a first for me, so I clicked it. The page loaded for a while before finally opening to a new page. It was black with red font and, much as the article suggested, had no title on top of the page. It appeared to just be another catalog site. There was actually very little of substance anywhere on the page, just random links with no real indication as to where they may lead. I clicked several of the links, but all of them turned out to be dead. Well, except for one that is, which opened to a disgusting image of a woman shitting on a guy's face. I nearly vomited at the sight of it. I have a pretty strong stomach when it comes to gore and violence, but poop is my kryptonite. Why would someone allow someone else to defecate on them, I will never understand. But then again, there's a lot of things I'll never understand, especially regarding the dark web. I knew it was a troll on their end, and I'll admit, they got me pretty good. I knew they were hiding something though. I mean, why go through the trouble of constructing an elaborate decoy if there wasn't anything illegal going on? 
Sure, creating the backdrop of the infamous government agency message wouldn't be too difficult, but if nothing illegal was going on, then why bother doing it at all? Mimicking my efforts from earlier, I highlighted the page once again. Sure enough, there was something at the bottom of the page which had been all but invisible beforehand. It was a series of numbers, spaced out horizontally. I thought at first it was another address, but there was no dot onion at the end. The numbers were organized as follows. 4, 9, 11, 6, 2, 7, 12, 1, 3, 8, 10, 5. I thought maybe it was some sort of password at first glance, but to what? All of the links were dead except that one with a nasty image, and I was not about to click on that again. I pondered over the image for a moment before noticing another detail. I counted the links and noticed that there were 12 in total. That had to be related to the numbers. I thought maybe clicking each link in order correlating to the strand of numbers would unlock something. So I tried that. After clicking the last one though, nothing had changed. I sat back and again studied the chain of numbers. There had to be a pattern or method to how they were organized. I pulled my phone out and punched the numbers into Google, but found nothing but tips for calculating fractions. In no mood for math, I put my phone away again and stared at the screen. What if the numbers weren't related to the links? What if this was simply a clue to another site of some kind? I scoured all over the page, clicking every square inch to try and find something. I don't know why I'd become so infatuated with discovering the answer, but boredom can be a deadly motivator. Suddenly, I was struck with an epiphany while staring at the top link. It had 12 digits in it. In fact, most, if not all, dot onion addresses have 12 digits in them. What if the numbers were clues to an entirely new address? I counted the links, and lo and behold, there was a grand total of 12, each with 12 digits. Maybe each number was in relation to the link in the sequence. Maybe they were dead links because they were never designed to lead anywhere. They were only designed to be clues. On a new hunch, I wrote down the fourth digit on the top link, the ninth on the second, the eleventh on the third, and so on and so forth, until I had an entirely new web address. I typed what I had written into the search bar and hit enter. My eyes widened as another web page began to load. I gave myself a metaphoric pat on the back for unraveling the mystery, but had no idea what I was about to stumble into. The page finally loaded, and I was given a new name at the top of the page. Happy Fun Time. There were dozens of pictures and videos organized all over the page, none of which I would describe as the words happy or fun. It was a gore forum. My heart pulsated in my chest as I looked upon the first image. It was a picture of a guy who had his skull crushed beneath the tire of a truck. Blood and gray matter had been scattered everywhere as several onlookers stood about gawking at the scene. The second was an image of another man who had been decapitated and had his genitals placed in his mouth, probably a victim of the foot cartels if I had to guess. The third was a video, a very depraved video. It was grainy quality and terribly shaky, but after a few seconds, it showed what appeared to be a lone woman walking down the street at night. The person filming was obscured by a couple dozen yards away in some alley. Suddenly, two men, other men emerged further down the street and bum-rushed the woman. They were on her in an instant. Before she even had time to scream, they grabbed her, and the cameraman sprang up to join the action. All the while he chuckled quietly in the most unsettling tone I have ever heard anyone utter. It was a giddy and juvenile giggle, the likes of which could only be produced by a severely deranged individual. The woman attempted to scream, but the two men held her mouth firmly, preventing her from doing so. They dragged her back into an alley as the giggling cameraman followed. I turned it off then, knowing exactly where it was headed. A reasonable person would have just exited the site by that point, but morbid curiosity is a powerful narcotic. The next entry on the list, though, ensured that any doubts I had of the authenticity of the site would no longer stand. It was a series of pictures, this time involving a little girl who couldn't have been more than five years old. She had sandy blonde hair and royal blue eyes. 
The pictures were innocuous at first, or at least they would have been if not for the site they were posted on. It started as just pictures that looked to be taken straight from someone's Facebook profile. A deep pit formed in my stomach as I sifted through them. The pictures began to grow ever more disturbing as they went. At first, it was the little girl with her family and dogs, but soon the pictures began to look as though someone was taking them without her knowledge. There was one where she was swinging at the park with several other children, another where she was playing with toys in a backyard, with the picture looking like it was taken from over the fence. I felt a cold chill creep down my spine as I anticipated where the pictures were headed. One picture stood out immediately. It was of a house at night, illuminated only by the flash of the camera. The next picture showed two people, a man and a woman lying in bed. Their throats were both slit, and their bed was soiled with a dark crimson. The next picture showed the little girl, clearly distressed with a black swollen eye. The reminder of the pictures went on to show the unknown cameraman take her and do terrible things to her. I won't even dignify his actions by putting them to paper. Some things are just better off forgotten entirely. Needless to say, it was the most goddamn disgusting thing I've ever seen. As horrible as the images were, the comments may have almost been on par. They were a mix of English and Russian, there were dozens of them, with almost all lobbing heaps of praise onto the vile cameraman and expressing their own sexual gratification with his actions. God is dead, and the dark web is proof of that. How in the world did we get to the point in which human beings like this can exist? I felt sorrow rise from within me for the innocent young girl who had been so violently violated and torn from the world. Normally, I feel nothing for random people on the internet, but the tragedy that befell her reminded me of things done to me in my own past. Maybe that's why I'm so fucked up. More than sorrow though, I felt anger. That was when I made my first mistake. Congratulations, fellas. You were without a doubt the most disgusting sacks of shit in the entire world. Cops have been notified, so have fun jerking each other off in the time you have left. Might as well do the world a favor though and just kill yourselves. I couldn't stop my hands from typing out the message, and before I knew it, my comment was inscribed just below all the others. It sat upon the screen for a moment before others began to appear, all of them insulting me and making fun of my empathy for the girl. Me and the other users fired back and forth for a while, before a familiar user posted. It was the same profile which had first posted the images to begin with. His first post confused me, as it was only a set of numbers with intermittent periods. I glanced at the comment before a horrible realization took hold. It was an IP address. MY IP address. Before I could react, he followed up with my full name, address, and social security number. I froze, unable to figure out how he would track me. It was then that I discovered my second mistake. Like an idiot, I had neglected to activate Tails. They had traced me, son of a bitch. Thanks for stopping by, friend. I'll see you soon. Then you will get a whole new episode on the site starring you. His words sent chills down my spine. I stared at the screen, dumbfounded, and without a clue how to proceed. Not content with two mistakes, and apparently with a secret lust for self-endangerment and masochism, I made a third one. Fuck off, I posted in the comment and quickly shut down the Tor browser and closed down my laptop. I thought about the events that had just transpired and somehow just ended up laughing them off. After all, there was no way that bastard's going to go through the trouble of tracking me down. People say shit online all the time, but they never act on it. It's all just empty threats. Either way though, I had some preparation to take care of. I called the police on the non-emergency hotline and informed them of the events. I gave them the web address I had gotten and they told me they would investigate it. After that, I called my insurance company to alert them about someone finding my social, and proceeded to drink myself stupid, hoping liquor would drown the memories. Days went by and nothing had changed. That is, until the end of the week. I had just returned from work when I saw an unfamiliar black Astro van sitting down the block from my house. I paid it little mind at the time, and to be honest, only realized the implications after the event. I had since forgotten my careless spree into the deep from days earlier and thought nothing of the van. 
I got inside again and booted up my computer for some mindless browsing. As I did, I heard a noise outside. It sounded like someone climbing the fence outside. I live alone and have no pets, so I knew whatever it was wasn't from my house. I thought about investigating it, but quickly the shattering of glass made it clear that it was not a good idea. I heard footsteps emanate from down below, giving the distinct sound of boots on hardwood floor. They grew nearer and nearer, and I found myself frozen with terror. It was like my body just refused to accept the situation, and would not respond, no matter what I did. That would have been a most astute time for me to have gotten my gun. Problem was, I didn't have one. The footsteps got louder and louder, all the way up the stairs with booming stomps of feet. I heard them trudge towards my bedroom door and lingered just outside. My heart was in my throat and sweat had begun to drip from every square inch of my body. The door slowly creaked open, and in stepped a man with dark clothing and a simplistic, porcelain mask. He walked inside brandishing a suppressed pistol in his right hand. He grew closer and closer, and then walked right past me. I don't know why they never bothered to check the closet, it's always the first place I look. I guess maybe he was too distracted by the doll which sat on my desk put up with headphones on to complete the decoy and lull in the approaching predator. I guess that inflatable sex doll came in handy after all. He stepped towards the dummy and I emerged from behind like a tiger from the jungle, silent and with ravenous hunger. I could feel the saliva begin to pull within my mouth as he reached the prop. He put a hand on the dummy and I put my hand on his throat. He struggled like they all do, but I quickly stripped the firearm from his grip. A simple incision underneath the arm with a blade does wonders in demanding obedience. All it takes is a slit into the ulnar nerve, and the arm becomes essentially useless. The unbearable pain it causes is also a bonus. He dropped the gun, and I slammed him to the ground face first. With one motion, I put my foot on his left elbow and grabbed his wrist with my hand while my other hand held the blade to his throat. I then leered close behind him and whispered to him, What time does my episode air? I don't want to miss it. Before he could respond, I yanked his arm backwards while pushing my boot firmly on his elbow. His bone cracked and then popped from its hinge as his arm bent backwards in the opposite direction it was meant to. The man cried out in an agonizing scream, but I quickly silenced him. He writhed upon the ground and moaned pitifully as the blood began to drip from his mangled arm. His eyes looked at me, and I could see that oh-so-sweet luster of panic-stricken prey glisten in his dark, brooding eyes. The hunter had become the hunted, and I could not stop the diabolic grin from slithering its way onto my face. It's time to feed. It's a weird feeling when you first kill someone. Most start as a crime of passion, anger which boils over and leads to an act of violence. You learn a lot about people in their last seconds of life. Their secrets, their faith, their fear. You learn a lot about yourself too. Like how you, a normal dude, could so easily swipe the life of another. There's a raw, primal satisfaction in that feeling. Knowing that you hold dominion over death, the feeling is addictive. Once is never enough though, and soon you will feel the urge to repeat your actions. The dopamine rush, the burst of euphoria, it's as sweet as honey to the mind. I was more careful from then on, picking targets with no relation to me and no reason to suspect my intent. After a time though, I grew tired of targeting the unsuspecting populace. It didn't thrill me in the way it used to. You can only shoot fish in a barrel so many times before you want to dive into the ocean. What I needed was a new challenge, a new prey to rekindle the flame beneath me. I don't want the sheep anymore, what I need now is the wolf. Do you have any idea how satisfying it is to see the eyes of a predator turn into a helpless little lamb? To know the terror they once instilled in others is now force fed down their throat. They never expect it, and there's no feeling so delicious. It's the ultimate poetic justice, monstrous actions done to monstrous people. The flood of adrenaline through their system also gives the meat a wonderful flavor. My real name is irrelevant, for the annals of history will forget. 
but I have become known in certain circles by my adopted moniker, Sig Sepsis. You can find my advertisements all over the web in one form or another. My skills are taboo, but refined. My clientele willing, and their tastes insatiable. To hunt a monster, you must know how to find a monster. You must become a monster. So to all the friends upon the forum known as Happy Fun Time, and the rest of the world at large, I see you. If any of you gentlemen would like to retrieve the remains of your fallen comrade, then you know where to find me. And if you, dear reader, happen to partake in the odious fantasies of the repugnant underworld as well, then perhaps I will see you one day too. I grew up all my life glued to a computer. When I first started talking, I was already browsing through my uncle's computer, switching between games. By the time I was ten, I was talking over my family's MSN accounts, and making them send each other awkward messages. I was ten at the time, so the messages were stuff like, I hate you, or give me back my Power Ranger. As you could imagine, I had no friends growing up. I was bullied and pushed around a lot. I'm autistic, so I guess that was the reason. I don't know. Nor will I ever. My old man kept telling me that I should stand up for myself. That I had to show them I wasn't afraid. Truth is, I couldn't fight back. I tried, but my punches were weak, and my kicks would tickle. I spent the best part of six years thinking the only way I could fight back was by physically fighting them. Little did I know that the world I grew up in, the virtual world, was about to become the second life for everyone. From here on, my mistakes started to pile up. I was 16. Everyone was using Facebook, Twitter, whatever was popular. People flocked to it. I had a main bully, as you could say. Brock. Brock was the definition of an asshole. I guess it made him what I did to him easier to live with. Brock loved to brag. His girlfriend was hot. His figure was fit, and he was amazing at sports. His only downside was he was dumb as shit and he hated anyone that excelled academically. Surprise, surprise, I was a smart ass. I was incredibly good at problem solving. I guess that was the upside to my autism. He hated that, and proceeded to make my life a living hell. I tried fighting back again, using my weak body, forgetting my strongest weapon was my mind. One day, I was browsing Facebook and found Brock as a suggested friend. He was in my world, and suddenly something clicked. I created a burn account, jazzed it up and made it look legit. I added Brock as a friend, and proceeded to find out as much as I could about him. I found his girlfriend, and added her too. I sent Brock an email from Facebook claiming his account had been compromised, and to download a PDF file with our security measures updated. Of course, he fell for my fake message. He wanted to keep his account, so he downloaded the document. Fool. I had access to his laptop, and proceeded to find everything there was to know about him. I knew so much at that point in time. I could tell you where he was, what he was doing, and who he was doing it with. I had his laptop camera send me images every so often to know what he was up to. When his girlfriend came over, I was ready. I booted up my online dating application and started sending messages to Brock. Hey baby, can't wait to see you tomorrow. Last week was a blast. I won't go into so much detail, but due to the fact that I knew where he was up to, it was easy to convince his girlfriend 
that the online babe was real. I didn't stop there. I downloaded on his laptop as much gay porn as I could find, at a time where homosexuality wasn't as accepted as it was today. You could imagine how his parents reacted to his fun drive. He didn't come back to school since then. My guess is that he moved out of town. I don't know. I don't care to look anymore. To me, that was a small victory, and I relished in it. Now I wish I'd have stopped there. Oh God, I wish I'd have stopped there. But I was addicted. The feeling of justice being served by my hands was one I wanted and wanted more. So I targeted criminals, the type that used the dark web to hide and spread their filth. For four years straight, I was a pain in their asses. I was on the deep web outing paedophiles, rapists, heavy drug dealers, you name it. If they were online, I would make their lives a living hell. I thought I was being smart. I thought I was hiding myself pretty effectively. But shit, something was following me every step of the way, and it would soon tell me. I woke up one morning, as any normal day, made eggs and toast for breakfast, with a glass of orange juice, booted up my desktop, and browsed Reddit. The usual was on, guys complaining that something was overpowered, something was underpowered, the game designers weren't listening, the usual morning chuckle. Then I heard a ping, the Facebook messenger notification sound. Funny? I didn't open Facebook yet. Maybe I did and I forgot. Would it make sense as I rarely open Facebook? It was odd, but not enough to sound any major alarms. A message from someone I don't know. Hey Danny, what's the weather like in Japan? What the hell? Weather in Japan? I'm on the other side of the world. The name read James Puckerson. On my other monitor, I started to go through his profile, trying to find any mutual friends, someone I met at a party or something. I responded with, Sunny I hope, anyone who knows me knows I hate the rain. I kept looking, but nothing of interest popped up. James replied, Oh, a funny guy. Tell me Danny, do you enjoy playing games? At this point, I thought he was referring to video games. Yeah, dude. What did you have in mind? League of Legends? RuneScape? I don't mind. Oh, Danny. I didn't mean one of those childish games. I mean a real game. You know, the type that involves putting one's life on the line? I let out a chuckle. Someone probably hacked my Facebook account, added this weird ass account and is now trolling me. This isn't a joke, Danny. I take these games extremely seriously. Okay, what? How did he know I laughed? Did he guess? There's no way he can see me. My camera isn't even plugged in. And how could he have gotten into my apartment? My Facebook profile had a fake address on it, and I never used my real address for anything. Not even Amazon or eBay. This had to be a joke. I wrote... Sure, dude. I'm bored as hell anyway. I was buying time to try and find out where this son of a bitch was. I scoured everywhere, trying to find any small clue to latch onto. I found something, and kept going and looking into it more, eventually leading me up to an address. When I looked at the address I froze, I could feel my blood draining from my face. It was my address. I was the only one living there, but somehow this asshole was using my address as a cover. Ping! Another message. I see you've gone extremely pale, Danny. What's the matter? Don't you believe in ghosts? I couldn't move. This guy could see me. He knew every move I was making, and I didn't know what to do. Do I run away and burn everything down? Fry my hard drives and shred my motherboard? What the hell's going on? 
Ring, ring, Danny. My phone started to ring, but it wasn't James. The caller ID read, Mum. I pick up. I hesitate to speak. I can't show my mum. I'm afraid that she'd worry. So I tried to act cool. Hey, mum. Everything all right? What I heard next made me drop my phone in horror. It made me realize this shit was real, and this wasn't a joke. A voice obviously modulated to hide the identity of the caller, but the threat was real, and I knew who it was. Hey, Danny. What's the weather like in Japan? I stood frozen in horror. Panic swept over my body, and thoughts flooded my mind. What happened to my mother? Is she okay? What is this son of a bitch doing with her phone? I knew I had to calm down. Something didn't seem right. I picked up the phone and looked at the caller ID. It said mum, no number. Shit, how could I be so stupid? He was just masking his caller ID. He must be trying to throw me off balance. I'll play along. There must be something I'm missing. Well, what are you doing with my mum's phone? Where is she? Is she okay? A laugh came from the other end. A deep, distinguished laugh. I decided to record the call. Maybe I can play around with the recording to find this caller's real voice. It may not be much, but this asshole knows where I live, and probably who my parents are. Then he starts talking. Danny, Danny, Danny. The safety of your mother depends on the outcome of our little game. I told you one's life is on the line, but I should have elaborated and said it shouldn't necessarily be the player's life. So are you ready to play? At this point, I had a thought. How can James see me? I have no cameras connected to the Wi-Fi. My desktop camera is disconnected and I ripped out my laptop camera when I got the damn thing. Another option would be he broke into my apartment and installed cameras when I was out. But why would he risk getting caught like that? I may have cameras at home and catch him doing it. No, he must be using one of my devices. Doesn't seem like I have a choice, James. Let's play. I braced myself for what he would say. We've all watched those horror movies. These games weren't exactly Mario Kart sort of level. Suddenly, I knew. I wanted to throw myself from my apartment for how stupid I'd been. In my hand, I held the single device that had a camera and was connected to my Wi-Fi. My bloody phone. I didn't want to jump to the conclusion that it was the only camera that was being used, so I decided to test it. Before I could do anything, he begins to speak. Well, 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 Danny. I must say you've got balls. Most guys would have started to cry or beg me to stop. This will most certainly be fun. I had had enough of this shit. I started to test my theory. I started googling shit like how to track a phone call and how to find cameras in a house. I wanted to see if he could see my screen, and sure enough, the confirmation came through. Oh, Danny, it's cute you're still trying to fight back, but I can assure you, you will not be able to track this call, and you will not find out how I can see you. Challenge accepted, dickhead. I angle my phone away from my bag, and take out a USB dongle. If this asshole is on my Wi-Fi, I'm gonna make him think he's controlling all of my devices. I look for my laptop, whilst trying to make as little noise as possible, and again, angling the phone away from what I'm doing. I find the laptop, boot it up, and plug in the dongle. Yeah, well, I'm one tough son of a bitch. So when we playing, James, and do go over the rules properly, yeah? I like to whoop your ass playing with your rules, dipshit. My strategy was to show no fear. In truth, I was terrified. 
but I knew the instant he smelled fear, he would have total control over me, and I'd mess up, and forget basic stuff, like I had when this shit show first started. My laptop finished booting up. Excellent. I knew this guy was using my network somehow. So I decided to hack my own network and see how he got in. Maybe he left something behind. The rules are simple, Danny. You wanted to play judge, jury and executioner. We are going to go through your history of white knight justice and see just how much of a hero you really are. Hero, huh? There was a time when I thought I was a hero. Maybe it was when I made a child molester and his own life. I told myself I was a hero, because he wouldn't hurt another child. In truth, was I a murderer? Was this my past coming to haunt me? No time to think about it. It wasn't just my life on the line here. Everyone I care about is in danger, and there's no time to be selfish. Ha, huh. hero. That's cute, James. But I've always known I was the devil. A necessary evil. But sure, let's walk down memory lane. Maybe that will remind you who the hell you're dealing with. My attempts were bringing up nothing. I managed to break into my own network many times, but I couldn't find a trace of another device. Not a trace of information transfer. Wait, information transfer? Outgoing and incoming traffic? Shit, I'm stupid. He can see a stream of my screen, which means I have outgoing traffic somewhere, right? I start monitoring my outgoing traffic. Encrypted, of course. But there was still an address, a server, that this information was going through. I find the address of the server and decide to do something extremely stupid. I might sentence myself to prison, or worse, no access to a computer. But I decided to pay a small price for the safety of my family. Well, well, Danny. Watch your screen as the images pop up. Let's roll the tape, ladies and gentlemen. What a psycho. I don't pay that much attention to the tone of his voice as I set up my botnet for a distributed denial of service attack. My hope is that if I bring down the server for a bit, I'll be able to see where the requests are coming from and track it from there. It's a long shot, but it might work. As I'm doing this, I also stop recording the call and send the recording over to my laptop. All the while I'm angling the phone away from the laptop. And since he hasn't spoken off, my theory that the only camera being my phone turns out to be correct. I finally feel like I'm making the right moves in this twisted game of chess. I'm hoping that I'll be the one to say checkmate at the end though. Victim number one, Brock, 16 years old. You destroyed his relationship and got him kicked out of his home. He spent three years on the streets before overdosing on heroin. That wasn't a nice thing to do, Danny. A picture of 16-year-old Brock pops up. He died? Shit. He was an asshole, but didn't deserve to die. I went too far. I went too far. But I couldn't admit it. Not to this psycho. I had to show him that I had no heart. Well, life sucks. Survival of the fittest and all. Maybe he should have been careful with who he messed with. Another disgusting laugh. James was enjoying himself. Maybe I should be. No time for that right now. I put the phone on loudspeaker and placed it on my desk. Wary that the front camera may be used as I kept well out of sight as I put my earphones into my left ear. Time to tweak around with this recording and unmodulate this voice. Danny, this isn't gonna end up well if you show no remorse. Now the fun begins. Remember his girlfriend? It's confession time, Danny. 
as if it were alive, my PC opened up Skype and auto signed in. Shit, I was so stupid. Was I really that lazy? A number is entered into it, and it starts dialing. What do you want me to do, James? Tell her the online babe was me, and that Brock wasn't a cheating dickhead? What's that gonna change? My botnet was ready, and I started to attack the server's address instantly. I then watched my incoming and outgoing traffic closely. All I needed was a hiccup, something that would lead me to James. In that moment, it was like the entire world grinded to a halt. In that moment, it wouldn't matter to me if the moon was crashing down onto the earth to end all life as we knew it. All that mattered was this stream of information. I could hear the second hand on my watch ticking away. There, a clue. Phew, I was starting to lose hope. I start work on it. Did James notice? I'd imagine his connection to my network might have dropped since I saw a request ping but nothing going back. Was he too busy trying to guilt trip me that he got too cocky and didn't notice? My Skype was still ringing. Was she going to pick up? Hello? The girl's voice. She sounded kind of cute, actually. Is James hooking us up? Wrong time for jokes there. James speaks to me. Go on, Danny. Answer her. Tell her your name and what you did to Brock. I decide to play along. True, he didn't call me from my mum's number. But that doesn't mean he still can't hurt her. Liz? It's Daniel Kurt. We went to school together with Brock. There was a pause. I can't imagine how awkward this must be for her. I didn't have time to care though. I ran a search on the address. And whilst that was going on, I continued tweaking with the recording. Danny? That loony kid that used to get beaten up all the time. Ah, oh, what a bitch. Hooking us up my ass. I had to fight back the urge to shout and educate her ignorant ass on what autism was. Whatever though, not my concern. At least, breaking the news to here won't be as painful as I thought. Yeah, that's me, the loony kid. I laughed, and I could swear I heard James laughing too. Asshole. So listen, I don't suppose you remember Brock Leonard. You kind of slept with him at the time. Maybe that weren't the best choice of words. Yeah, I remember him. I heard he died from a drug overdose. Makes me feel horrible breaking up with him. Another pause. Why? Shit. How do I do this? This is a confession. If she takes this to the police, I'm screwed. Any chance I have of getting away with this would be over. I was 16 though. Does it matter? I read somewhere that crimes committed before 18 aren't dealt with anymore. Was I a kid? Damn it. To hell with this. I needed to stop this madness before he makes this call a victim of an attack I committed after 18. Yeah, well, it's my fault he did this. He made my life shit when I was at school, so I decided to fight back. He never cheated on you. I made it look like he was. There was a really long pause, and it gave me time to work on the recording. Nothing remotely human yet and I was still searching for an address. Why is it taking so long? Her voice was extremely soft. I was expecting something else. An angrier tone would have made more sense. Danny? Yeah? I know. She knows? What does she mean? Is she connected to James? Or was this going against James' plan? Shit. Is she... James? Wait, how do you know? Another pause. What the hell is going on? How the hell does she know? My search comes up with something. James is definitely in the country. But I had to narrow it down. Why is it taking so long? I heard her taking a deep breath. 
I knew Brock was always faithful. It's why I stuck around. I wanted to leave him because he was a horrid person. Not to me, but to other people. I mean, look at you, Danny. You were bullied by everyone. But Brock kept taking it too far. And it wasn't just you. Other people would be pushed around by him every day. And I was sick of it. Another pause. Is she crying? I can definitely hear crying. I didn't want to cut it at all. I let her take her time. And after a few seconds, she continued. I guess I was looking for a way out. And seeing this girl that Brock was supposedly cheating on me with was my ticket. I knew he was faithful. But I had to take this chance and end the relationship there. I just didn't. I didn't know his life would be ruined because of it. I mean, for crying out loud, we were just kids. Her voice had gotten louder now. I could tell she was beating herself up over this. I had to comfort her in some way. Liz, this wasn't your fault. He made the wrong choices in life and ultimately couldn't live with them. You were trapped in that relationship. You were under no obligation to continue with him. It wasn't your fault. I did this, and I'll gladly take the blame. I've got to still ask, though. How did you know it was me? She laughs. I guess that was a stupid question. I knew the answer before she said it. I'm not stupid, Danny. I know Brock isn't the type of person to get in trouble with anonymous or stuff like that. I snorted. I knew Brock pissed off someone who was good with computers. And the only person I could think of was you. I laughed. I didn't care if James was listening. I didn't care if he would blast through the door and shoot me in the head. I laughed at how stupid I really was. And how I thought I was being clever. But a thought quickly wormed itself into my mind. James was not going to be happy with this outcome. Liz? Are you with someone right now? My thoughts said to get her somewhere safe. Somewhere James can't get to her. Without causing too much attention. No, I'm out. And then the line cuts. Liz? Liz? I pick up my phone. What the hell have you done, you twisted dickhead? There was silence. Not a single noise. I looked at my phone, puzzled. We were still connected. Where the hell did he go? This ain't time for a toilet break. Then I heard a sound. He's still there. And he starts to speak. His voice changed. Not modulated into something else. But his tone. He wasn't happy. Homo sapiens. An intriguing species. They never do things the way you accept them to. I hear a sigh. She will be dealt with soon. For now though, let's continue our trip down memory lane. Oh my god, he's going to kill her. Shit, I need to hurry up and find something. Anything. I can't let anyone else die because of me. I can't. Another picture shows up. The child molester that I scared the shit out of and ended up taking his own life. What sort of justice was James looking for here, if any at all? I started to panic. Why is he making me do all this? Surely if he knows I did these attacks, he has evidence. Why not just turn it all over to the police? All the more reason to find this arsehole. Jordan Fisher, age 36. You masqueraded as a child he molested and caused him to take his own life. Now you might think this an act of heroism, but if so, why haven't you told anyone about your heroic act, Danny? He was mocking me. He continued talk of heroism and disgusted me. I needed to find Liz. I needed to alert the police and let them know she was in danger. And what do you suppose you're doing now, James? Are you a hero to these people? 
Are you acting out their revenge? Wake up, shithead. These people are criminals. All I did was rid the world of them. I looked over to my search window. It was narrowing down, finally getting somewhere. Back to tweaking the voice recording. I felt like I was getting closer to finding out what the James voice was really like. But it wasn't male. It was definitely female. Well, anything that will tell me anything about James will help. One thing is certain. People feel safe as long as they're under the illusion that they're secure. Once you break the illusion, once you burst the bubble, they start to panic. And one thing you can be certain of is that people who panic mess everything up. Human nature, I guess. James responds, Justice? I'm not doing this for justice, Danny. I'm playing a game with you. It doesn't seem like you understand what the game is yet. I feel sorry for you. Let's continue. Fisher had a daughter. Did you know that? She was 15 when her dad took her own life. Tell me, Danny. Don't you think she should know why her dad died? I mean, it's only fair, right? Time to confess. Oh, I almost forgot. Her name is Sarah. You'll need that for when you talk to her. As before, another number was dialed from my Skype and began to ring. She was 15? I was still 16 at the time. Shit. How can a child molester have kids? I deprived someone of her dad, but he was a monster. What have I done? Hello? Who's there? Help me. A girl, her voice arching with distress. I could hear an echo. Where was she? And why does her voice sound like she's in trouble? James starts to speak again. Danny, you better answer her. Who knows what might happen to her? Another one of his laughs echoes through the phone speaker. He disturbed me. I guess I had no choice. Sarah? Are you okay? What's going on? I thought it'd be best to check if she was alright first, before confessing to my crime. Chivalry and that bullshit. I... I don't know. I think I'm okay. I can't feel my legs. Her breathing rate started to increase. Who? Who are you? Where am I? Help me, please. What the hell's going on? Did James kidnap her? I needed her to calm down. The hell kind of twisted game was this? Just calm down, Sarah. Take deep breaths, and can you look around and tell me what you see? I turned to my phone. James was silent. I wasn't having it. It was time for some answers. Okay, James. What the hell is going on? What have you done to Liz and Sarah? James was quick to respond to this. Ten minutes, Danny. You have ten minutes. Find them. I was just as quick to react. Scoo trying to find James right now. There are innocent lives on the line here. I needed to find them. I needed to trace Sarah's phone, and I had an idea how. Sarah responds before I could do anything. Uh, oh, it's so dark in here. I see a camera on a stand in front of me. I'm in a chair, but I can't get up. I can't feel my legs. It's so dark here. Oh my god, what's going on? Damn it. He's probably using a burner phone. No good to me right now. Tracing it will take ages. Hang on. Sarah's 19. She has to have a smartphone. Sarah, listen to me very carefully. I need you to fill your pockets. Do you have a smartphone? And if so, what is it? And is it on you? I hear a few groans. Whatever James did to her was painful. My guess is that her legs were broken. Yeah, I have my iPhone. It's not dead. Should I call the police? 
she asks hesitantly. But I could tell from her tone she was happy she still had her phone on her. If she calls the police, she dies instantly, James says. If you don't want her to die, you'll have to find her yourself. Damn. I didn't intend to rely on the police anyway, but they would have helped. I needed to find a way to explain to her just how dire the situation was, without making her panic enough to call the police. I didn't think James would be happy with me, telling her in the conditions of our little game. My brain worked quick. Sarah, no need to call the police. I'm Detective Haynes. I've been looking out for you, as you've been missing for a while. Now I need you to tell me what your iCloud username and password is. I'll track you using Find My iPhone. I tried to keep my voice down and calm in order not to induce panic. She gives me her details and I log onto the iCloud and start the search. Within a matter of seconds, it shows the location on the phone. It's not far from here. Five minute walk? Got her location, James. Now let her go, I say. Another laugh. How the hell can someone enjoy this? Oh, Danny, I didn't ask you to give her location. I asked you to find her. Run, Danny, but take your phone with you. We still have a lot to chat about. It dawned on me. So why was she so close? And why did it give me such a long time frame for such an easy task? I had to physically find her. I dropped everything and ran. Before I left the apartment, I grabbed a small kitchen knife and wrapped it in a towel. I might need it. Although I doubt I'll be able to do jack shit if a real threat shows itself. I run to the address as fast as I possibly could. I rarely exercised, and when I reached the address, I felt like dying. I saw a large building in front of me, at least seven stories high. There were no bells to ring. So I banged the door as hard as I could. No reply. I didn't have time to waste. I tried to find a weak spot in the door. It was so old that it wasn't too hard. Remember how I didn't exercise? Well, try bursting down a door when you struggle to open a jar of honey. I looked around for something to use. There were a couple of bricks laying around. I grabbed one and threw it at the door. Hoping there isn't anyone on the other side, but the brick just bounced off. I take it and start hitting the hinges of the door, and after a few swings, it finally lets loose. One hinge down, and no time to celebrate. And I kept hammering until it finally broke loose. Sarah, are you in here? Can you hear me? I run inside and look around hastily. There must have been 20 or so rooms in the building. I didn't have time to look through each one. Help, I'm here, help me please. That's Sarah. I run to where I hear her voice. Sarah, I'm here. Keep talking to me, I'm coming. Detective, I'm over here. Be careful, there's someone else here. I stop outside the door. Is James here? Would he risk exposing his identity like this? I'm running out of time. I take out the small knife and kick open the door. I step into the room, knife raised, steadying my breath. I look around the room. It's dark, and I wait for my eyes to adjust. I start to make out a chair with someone seating in it, a stand with what I assume was the camera from Sarah's description, and a figure standing opposite to me. A female figure. I couldn't quite see her face yet. My eyes were taking forever to adjust. I turned to face this figure while glancing at Sarah. Sarah, are you okay? I ask. I need to make sure she's fine before whatever is about to go down does. Yeah, I'm starting to feel my legs again, but I still can't move. There's another girl here, red hair, but she's passed out. She sounds relieved. I guess she thinks I'm a fit detective with dashing hair and stunning eyes. Oh, I do not envy her for the disappointment she's in. 
the red-haired girl was probably Liz. So this is the grand battle, then. At least it's almost over. Just as I'm about to address the figure, who I could only assume was James, I hear a voice coming from behind her. A familiar voice. Hey, Danny. I freeze. That voice. It can't be. No. It's impossible. But the more I thought about it, the more it made sense, but also terrified me. Who was the person I kept no secrets with? Who was the one person who knew everything I'd done? Who was the one person who had access to my address, PC, apartment, phone, and everything I owned? Who was the one person I shared my heart with? My one true love. Angela? I whispered softly. The thought that my girlfriend, my heart and soul, had done this to me, crushed me. I felt tears rolling down my face. Of course it all made sense. This supreme hacker never did any hacking at all. She had installed cameras in my apartment because she was always there. She knew I didn't have any of my own. She had her address spoofed as my own because she knew that's what it was. She added James to my Facebook account because she had the logging details for my Facebook account. I shared everything with her. And the thought of her doing this never crossed my mind. Why? Why are you doing this? What are you doing? I don't understand. What did I ever do to you? I'm speaking through tears and can barely string together the sentence. My eyes adjust to see her. Angela, is she crying as well? Or am I hallucinating? No, those are definitely tears. Is she really James? Or did James threaten to do this too? Ta-da! She sings through tears. Are you proud of me yet, Danny? Did you enjoy our little game? To this point, I'm angry, confused, and tired. Why? The tears didn't stop. Instead, they increased in intensity. Why are you doing this? Why are you hurting innocent people? Why are you hurting me? I've only ever loved you and cared for you. Why? She laughs. Her face is fake, and I can tell that she still laughs. Why? She says in a mocking tone. Don't you know why, Danny? Don't you know why your lovely girlfriend is doing this, Danny? Did you not find it odd that I didn't introduce you to my parents? Ever? I did find it odd. She was always reluctant on telling me who her parents were, but I didn't mind. I loved her for her, not her parents. What has this got to do with anything? As I'm still searching for answers, it hits me. Her dad must have been a victim of one of my attacks, and I confessed it all to her. But still, if he was a victim to an attack from me, he must have been a criminal. Why is she doing this? Oh, it seems like you understand, she says, still in her mocking tone. My dad was David Jessington. You know, the drug dealer you put behind bars. I loved you, Danny. I still do. But when my dad was arrested, he made me swear to make whoever did this pay. I tried and looked for whoever did it. But after a year, I gave up. Then I met you and fell in love. I thought we could live our lives together forever. Then you had to tell me that you wanted there to be no secrets between us. You had to tell me everything you've ever done including getting my dad arrested. She then takes a breath and wipes away her tear, then continues. I spent weeks fighting with myself internally. I tried to forget that I was in love with the man responsible for me not being able to see my father. I tried, but I couldn't. Eventually, I went and visited my dad. I asked him if I still had to make the one who did this pay even if it was someone I loved deeply. I pleaded with him to forgive me, but he looked at me and told me that if I had the power to avenge him and didn't, 
he'd disown me as a daughter and never forgive me. Her tears had returned, and she started to splutter as she spoke. Danny, I love you. I always will. But I swore to my dad, and if he ever finds out I let you go, he'll kill me. At least if I make it look like I made you pay, he'll let you go. And I don't care if I'm arrested. I don't care if you hate me forever. I love you, Danny. And that's why I'm doing this. My heart ached. I felt her pain. I felt her struggle. I wanted more than anything to just go and give her a hug and tell her it would all be okay. I dropped my knife and started walking towards her. I didn't care if she killed me. I didn't care if the whole world was against me. I loved her, and I wanted to fight for her. With every step I took towards her, my heart began to flutter. It was like I was falling in love with her all over again. But she kept crying, and raised her knife towards me. Tanny, please, stop, please, I don't want to do this. I can't let you get close to me again. Please, Tanny, stop, she pleaded, but I didn't care. She realized I didn't care if I died, so she raised the knife to her own neck. I stopped and stared at her eyes, her beautiful, hurting eyes. Please, Danny, I don't want to hurt you anymore. I can't do this. Please stop. I ran to her as she was about to drive the knife into her neck. I hold the blade with my bare hand, and blood starts dripping from the fresh wound. But I don't care. I stare into her eyes and softly whisper, I love you, Angela. I always have, and I always will. I don't care who your dad is. I don't care if the whole world is on his side. I will fight for you, and I will die for you. Stop this madness. Let's face the world together. She continues to cry and drops the knife, and leans in for a kiss. I hear sirens in the background. Someone must have seen me breaking into the building and alerted the police. But I didn't care. I was in my own world, with the other half of my heart. What happened next was a blur. First it was the police, then it was an ambulance. Angela and I were arrested, but thanks to the witness reports by Liz and Sarah, I was released immediately. I attended Angela's hearing, and she looked happy to see me there. Her sentence wasn't too long, less than her father's, but I didn't care. I promised to her I'd fight with her until the end, and I meant every word. I kept visiting her. Every time I'd get a chance, each visit with a new gift each visit with more stories to tell each other. She'll be out one day, and I will always be there for her. And once she does, we'll move away. I'm working hard, taking every shift I can, earning every penny. I won't hack ever again. I would ever take justice into my own hands again. Because even though I may have helped someone, I have also hurt another. And maybe they deserve it. Maybe what I did was right, but I am not justice. I have no right to claim to be. I have made some mistakes in the past, and maybe James was my justice. For now, though, I know what I must do, and I have my heart set on the path I have chosen. Maybe I made the wrong decision. Maybe I should have let her die and continued my vigilante run. Maybe there is a place far enough away for us to run to, where her father can't find us. But I don't care. My fight isn't over. It's only just begun. July 1st, 2018. A face is staring into the camera. Sandy hair, mid-twenties, male. Somewhat reminiscent of a squirrel in his rapid mannerisms. The big day is finally here. This is our first time testing out our new spider bot on the dark web, and we're both pretty excited. We've only got a week left to iron out the bugs before Kevin has to defend his thesis, but I don't anticipate any problems. Kevin is nervous as hell, but 
The kid's an absolute genius. He's still configuring his Tor network and VPN, so I'm going to catch everyone up who are just joining the stream now. Typical web crawlers haven't been able to explore the dark web because they can't index specific inputs like forms or authentication passphrases. I mostly hear from moral support and don't understand it completely, but to my knowledge, Kevin Spiderbot has machine learning algorithms, which have been training the last few weeks to learn a new adaptive method of keyword selection. You hear that derisive snort at my oversimplification? Yeah, that's Kevin. Say hello, Kevin. Shut up, Brian. Whatever, fuck you too, man. Based on the training results, we should be able to index a couple thousand pages a day. Google only reaches 16% of all available websites, so that means it's going to take us approximately forever to get through it with all our current computing power. This is just a proof of concept, though. All we're using at the moment is Kevin's old laptop that his dog Crinkles practically smashed. The power cord was stretched across the room, and this little bulldog comes barreling right through. Hold on, it looks like we're good to go. If all goes well, then in a couple of months, you're going to start reading about how the dark web ceased to exist because of our little spider. I'm going to end the stream now to let it get started, but join us again tomorrow to explore all the cool stuff we found. July 3rd, 2018. The sandy haired man is back. There are bags under his eyes, but he's enthusiastic as ever. Hey guys, it's me again. Sorry for the delay, but we hit an unexpected bump. Spider was doing great and had already logged a few hundred sites when it abruptly stopped with this weird error. He keeps telling us that it's already indexed everything. Kevin is able to manually direct to keep finding new sites, but as soon as it's automated, it just says finished again. Kevin is practically ripping his hair out, but it's not like this has been a complete waste of time. We did discover a brand new, never before seen color that I'm pretty sure didn't used to exist. All Kevin had to do was put on a white t-shirt a week ago, then eat nothing but barbecue chicken wings and sweat out the sauce. Anyway, Brian rambles, it looks like we might still be a while, so... Got it. I don't understand it, but I've got it. Well, whip me red and call me applesauce, because it looks like we're back in business. What? That's not a saying. Nobody says that. Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. You've got to get out more. People are saying stuff like that all the time, so what was the holdup? It's all linked. Look at this. A drug marketplace? An anime forum? A counterfeit producer? Some dungeon porn? You have my attention. It's all referencing the same destination. Spider stops indexing because it thinks the whole dark web is this one site. I'm gonna try to get in. That relates to a joke I know. So a drug lord, a weeboo, and a con man, and a porn star all walk into a bar. This isn't a real joke, just shut up, I'm trying to concentrate. And the barman says, what are you guys doing together? So the drug lord says, they've all got something to hide. Even the porn star? It's gotta be a blackmail thing. These guys must be tunneling into other websites to get a hold of our info for their ransom. But there's no way they can be everywhere. Every single spider finds... Shit. Shit. Motherfucking bitch sticks. Oh, like that's a real saying. They're on my computer. I have no idea how they trace spider back, but the mouse is moving on its own. It's typing an address into Tor. What are you doing? Popping out the battery. The power button isn't working. No, don't! Dude, give that back! Nah, man. This is what people are here to see. Let's find out what these, where these hackers are trying to take us. I swear to God, Brian. An overweight torpedo wearing a blotchy shirt of unclassifiable color hurtles across the screen. The streamer's chair tips over, and both men go down. The laptop is left in front of the camera where a long line of seemingly random letters and symbols are typing themselves into the address bar of a Tor browser. This website loads. A countdown timer starting at 15 minutes begins to tick down. Kevin and Brian stick their heads up over the desk in unison to stare at it. At least shut that damn camera off, Kevin says. Only if you let the countdown so we can see what happens, Brian replies, swatting away Kevin's hand which stretches for the laptop. 
God, you're such an asshole. Whatever. Fine. Just shut it off. The sandy man begins to wave, but the screen cuts off halfway through. When the stream turns the timer, the timer reads 15 seconds. The angle is weird, as if the camera is in his lap hidden beneath the desk. The looming Brian is pacing and muttering to himself in the corner of the screen. Kevin surreptitiously leans over the camera and gives a thumbs up, mouthing the letters OMG. The timer hits zero and stays there. A dog starts barking somewhere in the distance. Are you happy now? Kevin grunts. Give it back, okay? There's a knock on the door. A single knock, loud and deliberate. The barking intensifies, snarling, growling, all hell breaking loose in its little world. Not really, Kevin whispers. A second knock, then a third, each about three seconds apart. You get it. Both men say it nearly the same instant. They stare at each other until the next knock. This is your fault. Kevin wheezes in a voice halfway between a whisper and a shout. Yeah, yeah, he replies. He approaches the door, the camera angle still at waist height, then in a louder voice, Who is it? Are you still recording? Kevin hisses. Unbelievable. The screen's filled by the door as Kevin gets closer. He's right up against it, so he's probably looking through the peak hole. Crash. A sound loud enough to max out the speaker volume. The door explodes inward in a wave of splinters. The screen shakes erratically and there's nothing but splinters and lances of light and screaming. A gray skin hand streaks across the camera. If you freeze the frame, you'll notice that the skin looks more like coarse cloth and that there's stitching running up and down the fingers. The stream cuts off. July 10th, the streamer is back. His face seems paler. His skin's breaking out and his hair hangs in greasy strings around his face. He's sitting in a bare table in a concrete room. The lights are dim, but there's a large man standing in the back of his room. His hands are folded motionlessly in front of him. Um, yeah, hi guys. This might be my last broadcast for a while. He glances back at the figure in the corner, but there's no movement. Back to the camera. Kevin's okay. I mean, he's different, but he's okay. He glances back to the corner of the room, but the figure still hasn't budged. Brian's shadow shifts with his movement, and for a moment, the stitched cloth of the person in the corner is visible running all the way up his arm. I guess they had something like spider. They were only tunneling into websites on the dark web anyway. I guess those kind of people could disappear without as many questions being asked. They wanted my followers to know, though. Brian swallows. He looks behind again, then a sudden burst of movement, grabbing the camera and dragging it up to his face. Close your browser now. Shut off your computer. The figure in the back has started to move, great lumbering steps charging forward. Brian's words are a breathy rush. It only takes 15 minutes for them to find you once they have established a connection. The cloth hand sees Brian from behind and drag him off camera. Don't do this, Kevin, he shouts. How long has your browser been open already? Just shut the damn thing off. There's a heavy thud. A heavy set face appears in front of the camera for a moment. The human eyes look strange embedded within the cloth. Stitches run down either side of the face along the jawline. The cloth might just be sewed to the skin, but it fits so closely to the anatomy of Kevin's face that it looks more like the cloth has replaced it. The stream cuts to black replaced by the last few seconds of a depleting timer. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I'd like to give a huge thank you to Elders Vault for helping me in this video. It was a pleasure, and I really, really like his work, and think that you should definitely check it out. Now that you've been thoroughly horrified from the deep web, why not come join me and Elder over on his channel where we go look at some real deep web stuff and see the horrors that we uncover. So, you'll be able to find the link on screen or in the description. I'll see you guys there.